Um, just a reminder, I sent a message out on Moodle a week or two ago, obviously since the, after the semester started, about the research experience for undergraduates. You guys are in prime position to apply for those. Um, there are great opportunities for students who are interested in the sciences, whether it's you know going to medical school, dental school, um, graduate school in physics, chemistry, whatever, engineering. They're great opportunities. They pay good money. Um, I was just talking before class with Nathan about one at UNL that involves bringing the teacher along, and the teacher gets paid five thousand dollars a month. The student gets paid four hundred fifty dollars a week, and that's that's more money than teachers at Union College make in a month. Just you know. Um, so look at those. They pay good money. Um, one of the ones that Nathan and I are excited about. He's going to apply, right, Nate? Yeah. Has Pays him $5,300 for the summer and involves working in Switzerland. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds like a good plan to me. So look into those. You can do searches. There's lots of options. I strongly encourage you. It's a great experience. Pays you good money. It's going to look good on any resume when you're applying for a job or graduate school or professional school. And they're funded by the federal government. It's your tax money at work to train minds. DJ. So these are like all over the place, right? Looking yes, they are all over the place. They're, um, the REUs are specific to the United States um, since they're funded by the federal government. The one that I was talking about is out of Duke University. Um, there are other summer research opportunities out there, but that's the biggest single place to look. All right, continuing where we left off last class period. So we talked about this picture before the start of last class period, and we didn't get very far into it. Some things that I wanted to point out, this is the last slide we had last class period, the relationships between work and energy and voltage. So this one right here is a very short derivation. If we have a particle move parallel to the electric field, if it's a uniform electric field, the work we know will be force dot to the distance, so if it's parallel force dot distance, it's just going to be force times distance. Force is charge times electric field, because that's the purpose of electric field. So the work is going to be QED, which could stand for quantum electrodynamics or quadrat demonstratum, or in this case, charge times electric field times the distance it travels. And so the change in potential energy is minus the work. So the change in potential energy is minus QED. And then since change in voltage is defined as change in potential energy divided by charge, then the change in voltage is minus ED. So the outcome of this is if you're moving parallel to the electric field, if you're not moving parallel, you know what you do? Just make it a dot product with vectors. Then you can do it for any direction. But this does only apply if you have a constant electric field. If it's changing electric field, calculus, my friends. So for this class, we're only going to apply this if it's a constant electric field. Electron guns. We all like guns. They go pew pew. We like to play with them, maybe. We probably don't want to get shot. We may be worried about people around us with guns. You know, some people have different views. But electron guns, we use those all the time. Now, these days, we have this kind of computer monitor, which is wonderful, except for it's disappointing from this lecture standpoint. Because back in my day, our computer monitors, well, back in my day, you don't want to know. Uh, we didn't have, anyway, when I was a child, we had televisions. And the televisions use cathode ray tubes. And the, the key element of a cathode ray is a cathode ray is a beam of electrons. And so you're shooting electrons. And so it used to be that I could talk about this. And people had a very real understanding. In the back of your television set, you have an electron, well, in the back of a tube television. You guys do know what a tube television looks like, right? I mean, not that far removed from, from this. You have essentially a, well, I'm going to draw it 
like this, you have a wire and you run electricity through that wire. We call it current and you run AC current actually. And that AC current makes the wire hot. And when the wire's hot, it kicks off electrons. So the goal of this at this point, since you don't even know what current is, is that you're going to have electrons that get kicked off of this wire. We want the electrons to come shooting out here. So what am I going to have to do to make the electrons go shooting off to the right? To the what? Not a magnet. We'll learn about magnetism later, but a magnet won't do this trick. We need to put a plate with a hole. So we put out here in front of this a plate with a hole in it. And if I want to attract the electrons to that plate, what kind of charge do I have to put on it? Positive, because opposites attract. So this has to have a positive charge. If it has a positive charge, what does that tell you about the voltage difference between these two? Which one is more positive, the positive thing or the negative thing? We, we have people jokingly saying the wrong answer, which implies that everybody just thinks it's too simple and they don't want to be embarrassed by saying the obvious answer. The positive charge occurs with a positive voltage. So we put something like five, whoops, didn't give me myself space, 5,000 volts between my little filament that's kicking off electrons and that front, front plate with a hole in it. Now, the front plate with the hole, and there's some research that goes in, and it's not just a flat plate with a hole. But the essence is fine. So I have an electron that comes off of here with the, essentially kinetic energy here is zero. The kinetic energy is going to be going between about plus or minus 10 electron volts. What's the kinetic energy going to be here? It's going to be 5,000. Remember, let's show the calculation. We have work. Well, let's do it this way. Change in voltage is equal to change in potential energy over charge, right? So change in potential energy is equal to Q delta V. And change in kinetic energy is equal to minus change in potential energy minus Q delta V. So this is a negative charge. Negative E is the charge. So change in kinetic energy is equal to parentheses minus E for the charge. Don't forget the minus sign that was in front of the Q. So it's minus a negative E times the voltage difference. The voltage is going up 5,000 volts times 5,000 volts. So minus and minus is a plus. 5,000 volts times one electron is equal to 5,000 wow, electron volts. And so if it started at zero, it's going to end at 5,000 electron volts. Now that's great, good, fine, dandy. But what we probably want to know if we're going to design our television is how fast the electrons traveling. So how can I go from this kinetic energy to how fast it's traveling? How does kinetic energy relate to speed? One half mv squared. Therefore, v is equal to, there is technically a plus or minus. I think at this point, we can all just say we, we only care about the plus sign, right? So I'm going to erase the plus or minus. Square root of 2 times that kinetic energy, 5,000 electron volts, 
divided by the mass. Mass of an electron is 9.109 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. Notice I left myself a lot more space. I have electron volts divided by kilograms. Anyone want to offer what that might be in units? Didn't think so. We need to convert from electron volts into our standard unit. What's our standard unit for energy? Joules. And the conversion factor, the thing I ended on last class period, is one electron volt is equal to 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So I multiply this by 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 joules per electron volt. Now I will have units of joules over kilograms in my square root. Well, a joule is a kilogram meter squared per second squared. So if I divide that by kilograms, I'm left with a meter squared per second squared. I square root it, and hooray, I have units of meters per second. So how fast this was solving this for V. It looked like kinetic energy without writing the V there. How fast would this electron be traveling? And you can put, of course, 10,000 for 2 times 5,000. And 10,000, that's 10 to the fourth. So you have 1.602 times 10 to the minus 15 over 9.109 times 10 to the minus 31, all square root. Now, you want to know something a little bit scary? That's a, what we would consider a relativistic speed. At that speed, our equation for kinetic energy isn't quite right. But we haven't learned relativity yet. Those problems that they assume non-relativistic. So we're going to have a little error here because our equation for kinetic energy isn't right if we get that speed. But we're going to stick with it. That's a very fast moving electron. Um, uh, where do I have? Okay. So continuing on with the TV screen, the cathode ray tube TV, the next thing you do after you have, see here's the picture that matches what Sarah had said. You have the filament back here that's kicking out electrons. And then you have, here's the plate. So you have the voltage difference between here and there. We want those electrons to not just strike one point on the TV screen. Life isn't all that fun if your TV screen appears to be one dot. We want it to scan across the screen and to go up and down. And so that's accomplished with two sets of deflector plates. So you have this one here that's a horizontal. Whoa. Nice color choice, Richard a horizontal deflector plate. And so they put a voltage difference across those plates. Put a voltage difference, you're going to create an electric field. That electric field then is going to put a force on the charge when it's going through the electric field, force of Q times E. And so by adjusting the strength of that electric field, you adjust the force, and thus it's going to accelerate to a horizontal velocity that depends on how long it's in those plates and how fast, well, how long it's in is how fast it's going, um, and the voltage difference you make. And so that is used to make the electron beam go across the screen. 
And so the voltage on this, because you want a nice smooth passing across the the screen for the horizontal deflector. The voltage is going to be going like this. This little thing here is a dead time when you're not putting something on the screen. And so you just have that voltage ramping through. Now, I don't know if they still run these commercials. I don't really watch TV commercials anymore. Um, but they used to have commercials for technical college where they teach you how to be a television repairman. And they show a guy with his oscilloscope looking at these patterns. And you're seeing the pattern of the voltage for the ramp for the deflector because it's you know something nice and good that, that makes sense. And they can say, ooh, see, we know what we're talking about when their family saying, what's that? So that's the horizontal deflector. Then you have the vertical deflector. What should the voltage look like for the vertical deflector? Just think about the goal and tell me what the voltage is going to look like for the vertical deflector. It'll what? It, it can't be the same as the horizontal because then you'd be making diagonal lines. We want to stay at the same elevation as we're going across one line and then jump to another elevation for the next line. Uh, so it would be constant. Yes. So it's going to go like this, and then during this time here, it drops down to the next level. During this time here, it drops down to the next level. And so you have a stepwise pattern to make the electrons go different positions on the screen. So all of this stuff, you know, just like when we talked about the photocopier, it's not that hard to understand once we understand the principles of electric force. Still complicated to put together. I don't want to make it sound like it's simple to put together the television. And these voltages are very high voltages. It's very dangerous. If you ever work with the cathode ray tube, which you guys may never do, always make sure that you do things to be safe. Like there is going to be a place for you to put a grounding stick. And you want to make sure you put that in there before you work on it. You unplug it first. Then you put the grounding stick in. Then you can work on it. Um, because those high voltages will kill you. And just because you unplugged it doesn't mean that you don't still have the high voltages because they use capacitors, the next topic we're going to talk about, that will store the high voltages for a very long time. If you've ever done anything with electronics and they tell you, you know, you need to reset it by power cycling it, they always tell you to do things like unplug it. And I was just looking at my weather station. Hit any button 30 times in a row. You're like, why do I have to hit the button 30 times in a row? Because each time you're draining a little bit of that charge off the capacitor so that you can bring it down so that it doesn't have any charge anymore and all the electronics stop. Otherwise, they, they keep going and they'll you know, keep memory. Um, the same thing applies to, well, just about anything, a computer. If you have something go wrong with a computer, sometimes all you have to do is turn off the power supply. I unplug it just to be completely sure that the power supply is not giving some trickle. And then you do things like you press the power button 10 times or something. Each time you press the power button, it will drain a little bit of power off of the capacitors so that you get no charge and that will make all of your memory disappear and you can start over fresh. Okay. I have a few things before we talk about capacitors. Equipotential lines. We've already talked about them, but here's where I got all specific about them. So we've already learned rules about electric fields and equipotential lines. Electric fields tell us the direction that the force will be on a charge. Equipotential lines are lines where there is 
no work done if you move a charge along those lines because it's equal electric potential. Which means that there must be no force in the direction you move the charge. Hence, since force is parallel to electric fields and X potential lines are in the direction of no force, X potential lines are always perpendicular to electric fields. So if you can construct the electric field lines, you can automatically construct the equipotential potential lines. Or if you have the equipotential potential lines, you can automatically construct the electric field lines. And so you have examples here. We have two plates, zero voltage on one side, 100 volts on the other. Notice we have real edges now. It's ideal behavior in the middle part, but the edges, we see the electric field is not uniform. And so if we have 100 volts difference between the plates, where it's uniform, that is where the space between the lines is constant, then the electric fields are straight lines going across. And we know that those straight lines, the uniform electric field means that the energy drop per distance is constant. So that's why we know that the equipotential lines are vertical where we have the horizontal lines there and spaced equally. So 100 volts, 75, 50, 25, and zero, all equally spaced there. With the point charges, it reads a whole lot like an elevation map. So where you have the, these equipotential lines, you have the voltage, the electric potential changing. And these points here, because I can see it goes from minus 5 to minus 10, those are the lowest possible electric potentials. We have point charges. What's the electric potential at the point charge? At the point charge, what is it? Zero. Not zero. It's divided by zero. Yeah. So it's approaching plus or minus infinity. So you don't have some number written here at the center because it's approaching plus or minus infinity. So here on the charges, you have undefined electric potential. And electric field lines, remember, they go into negative, so that's why you have the lines as they're drawn. Um, I, I have this here just to make sure people pay attention. What's the relationship between potential lines and electric field lines? Michael, they're perpendicular, to each other. they're perpendicular to each other. So potential lines are perpendicular. None of these say perpendicular, but that is a true statement. They're perpendicular. I actually thought that was what I had for one of the answers. Before you answered, I thought I had it for one of the answers because <laughs> they are perpendicular. So let's look at these other statements now that Michael's given us the one that that feels best. Are they the same thing? No. Remember, the answer potentially can be yes. For instance, if I said, what's the difference between voltage difference and electric potential um, difference? The answer would be nothing. They're the same thing. Unless I ask the book, yes. Every potential lines show the direction of force? No, they show the lines where you would have no force parallel to them. Electric field lines indicate energy? No, that's reverse. So it must be this one here. Electric field lines show the force. Electric potential lines indicate energy. So electric potential lines are at constant energy. Um, just another picture. Moving on. An electron is placed between two vertical parallel plates at 100, minus 100 volts and minus 50 volts respectively. And so I have in the middle an electron. What's that electron going to do? Okay, Nathan said, I think Nathan said, go to the right. Why? Yeah, less repulsive, if you will. The voltages, after all, are really only relative. And something that is more positive is going to be more attractive or less repulsive than something that's more negative. 
And so even though they're both negative, the electron is going to have a net force pushing it toward the minus 50 volts and away from the minus 100 volts. The reason I have that, I have both minuses, so you have to think about that aspect. Okay, capacitors. Capacitors was technically the topic for Wednesday. Today is technically introducing Ohm's Law. In lab on Tuesday, I will lecture on Ohm's Law before we get onto the lab. But here I'm going to talk about capacitors. Capacitors store energy. And I have here store energy in electric field. That's one of two ways of describing it. You can either say they store energy in the form of an electric field, or you can say they store energy in the form of a charge separation. Capacitors do not store charge. They store a separation of charge. Um, Wes was talking about, hey, how about we make a Leiden jar for our lab project? A Leiden jar is a special type of capacitor. It stores charge. You can charge those Leiden jars up to very high voltages. And, you know, that's they store a charge separation. I said store charge because I get lazy too. But they, they're storing a separation, storing lots of energy. And so these are what capacitors look like in real life. So, you know, this here is a very common look for a capacitor. This here is a common look for a capacitor. So you see these things. They are things that are storing energy in the form of an electric field or storing energy in the form of a charge separation. So the simplest way to draw a capacitor, this is not the practical design, but this is the simplest way to draw a capacitor. So what we have are two plates that are parallel to each other. And then we connect a battery. A battery is a battery of cells. That's why it's called a battery. So double A's are single cells. They're not batteries. So you shouldn't call them double A batteries, but everybody does, including the battery makers. But this is a battery. This has multiple cells, voltaic cells, and you connect it to those plates. Now, if I have the positive terminal, the positive terminal is a positive terminal because it has less electrons than it should have for neutrality. And so if you're missing electrons, what's naturally going to happen? There's electrons available. For instance, on that metal plate, what are they going to do? They're going to be attracted to the place that's missing them. And so you're going to have the battery is going to pull electrons off of here, leaving it with a positive charge. The negative terminal has an excess of electrons. So there's excess of electrons onto the other plate. And batteries don't store, make, anything like that charge. All the batteries do is they give energy to charge. And it used to be thought that the battery is doing work on the charge, I mean, it's doing a force times a distance doing work on the charge. And so we talk about voltage for a battery as an EMF, an electromotive force, a force moving electrons. Not correct. It's a, a misnomer, an anachronistic name to when that's what people thought was happening. But batteries are giving energy to charge and causing the charge to be separated in the battery. And when you connect a wire to it, then you're going to have electrons move from one side of the battery to the other side of the battery to keep the energy difference until the battery goes dead. So what's going to happen is you end up with a negative charge spread out over this plate and a positive charge spread out over this plate. But if I have a negative charge and a positive charge, what direction do electric field lines point? They go from positive to negative. So I'm going to have electric field lines that are going like this. And in the region between them, it's going to be nice and uniform. The edges, it won't. We just focus on that region between and, and ignore the edges, if you will. So we're going to make this electric field. 
Now we've learned from earlier today that the voltage difference is equal to the electric field times the separation. I just remember that as V, V equals head. So the electric field can be calculated immediately if I know the separation between those plates and I know the voltage I put on it, right? The electric field is the voltage difference over the separation. So we have that electric field and there's energy stored in that electric field because we have the positive and negative charge being held apart. The positive and negative charge would like to come together and thus the energy. So that's the essence of how a capacitor works. Now, if you look at this lower picture, this is what it looks like inside of this capacitor. You have your conductors, so you can see they're different colors. Um, you have the silverish looking one, the copperish looking one. You put an insulator between them for a clear reason of you don't want them to be touching and have charge transfer between them and then roll it up. It allows you to get a fairly large surface area for a fairly small volume. And so it allows you to increase what we call the capacitance, which we will see on the next slide. That is a common design. When you look at things like this, this one here, inside it's much more complicated. It's kind of fractal in nature. You have something like that. And then something like this, and then they flow in an insulator between them. And so you have the negative and positive. Now you have them, you can pack them even tighter with these kind of fractal arrangements so that you can have more area per unit volume. So what is the capacitance? The capacitance is a measurement that tells us the relationship between how much charge we're separating on the two plates and the voltage difference. So capacitance is the ratio of charge separation to voltage. And the next two lines are all you need to calculate what the actual capacitance is for a parallel plate capacitor. So the voltage difference for parallel plates, as we said, is Delta V is equal to Ed. And the electric field, we get this actually, I get it at least by using Gauss's law. The electric field between the plates is the charge on one plate divided by the surface area of the plate and this thing that's called the, do you remember it from before? It's the constant called the permittivity of free space. Well, it's a free space if you put the zero there. You don't put the zero, it's just the permittivity. So it's more general like that. If I put this into here and this into here, then I'm going to have capacitance is equal to Q divided by ED is equal to Q over Q over A epsilon D. The Q's are now going to cancel. The A epsilon over D then is capacitance. So there's the equation for the physical capacitance. The capacitance increases if the area of the plates increases. Why? Because you have more area to put the charge on. And so you're going to allow it, be allowed to have more charge for the same voltage because you have more area to distribute it on. It's divided by the separation because the electric field gets stronger as the separation decreases. So that's the equation for physical capacitance, as we call it. Now, sometimes we make a capacitor differently. To make it better, we put a dielectric between the plates. A dielectric... is something that has an electric dipole moment. So you see here that dielectric has a positive side and a negative side. 
you put the dielectric in your capacitor between the plates and you have a positive side and negative side, well, the dielectric is naturally going to rotate if it's something that's allowed to rotate so that the negative is next to the positive because opposites track. And so you can see in that picture, all of the dipoles are oriented so the negative is close to the positive on the plates. Positive is closer to the negative. Well, what this does is it's going to lower the electric field strength between the plates because the dipoles are making an electric field that's opposing the external electric field. And by lowering that electric field, you allow yourself to increase the charge you're going to put on there, and that's the voltage you're going to put on there, for the same electric field. So as a result, your capacitance will increase as you put a dielectric with a better dielectric behavior on. And so kappa is called the dielectric constant. And it tells you how strongly the dielectric will react. Basically, it's telling you how big the electric field will be compared to the external field. And so capacitance is kappa, the dielectric strength, times epsilon zero. Epsilon zero was the permittivity of free space. times area over separation. Do keep in mind, this equation is only for parallel plate capacitors. You will exclusively work with parallel plate capacitors. If you change your geometry, it's gonna get more complicated and we want to keep things as simple as we can while doing these complicated ideas. Now, just backing up again, what is the point of the capacitor? Its purpose is to Store energy in the form of charge separation or electric field. Either one of those answers is correct. So the purpose is to store energy and charge due to charge separation or electric field. That's why the things I was talking about for safety with working with the television set. You have capacitors in there that you put high voltages on. That means the capacitor is storing a lot of energy. Just because you turn off the power doesn't mean that energy has been drained. And that's why you have the issues you need to take care of before you work on a television set to make sure you drain that energy. Here's some materials that are used as dielectrics. So air. Air has a dielectric constant of 1.00054 if it's dry. In other words, air is essentially the same as a vacuum. A vacuum has dielectric constant, constant defined as one. And so air is essentially vacuum. So for everything we do, we will essentially say air, vacuum, no difference. And we'll put in one for kappa or just drop kappa. Something that is very commonly used is paper that has wax on it. That wax paper is two to four times the dielectric strength of air, which means if you put the wax paper between your plates, you'll raise the capacitance by a factor of two to four times. So it allows you to increase the capacitance. Then we see some other things, Teflon, rubber, just plain, plain paper, mica. Mica is a better dielectric constant, hence in, in the capacitors like the rolled up one, if you cut them apart, you're probably going to find mica in there as the dielectric because it allows you to raise the capacitance for the same um, volume. There's a second thing on here that's called the dielectric strength. Strength and constant are different things. The dielectric strength is something that Andrew looked up during the first lab. Andrew looked up the dielectric strength of air. That is, what's the maximum voltage per unit length you can have, what, what is the volt per length? What's, what's another name for that unit?
I'm going to drop the M for millimeter. I'm just going to put M for distance. Another way of writing volt per meter is Newton per Coulomb. Do you remember something we've used recently that had units of Newtons per Coulomb? I'll go one step further. If we had an equation, it would be X is equal to the thing that has units of Newton is force. Thing that has units of Coulomb is charge. What did we have that was force over charge? Electric field. And so this dielectric strength is the maximum electric field that you can have across that material before you have arcing occur. And so for that first lab, Andrew looked up and found that value of three kilovolts per millimeter, saying that if you have an electric field that's stronger than three kilovolts per millimeter, you're going to suddenly have electrons start flying through it. And so then we measured the maximum distance that we can have an arc, and we multiplied it by that electric field strength to find what the voltage difference was between the Van Graaff generator and the person who was standing out there getting the VGs that shocked out. So if you look at these dielectric strengths, there's another good reason for mica. What's the other good reason for mica? It has a really high dielectric strength. What that means is you can put a much stronger electric field across that mica before you have arcing go through it. So it's going to raise the maximum voltage you can put on a capacitor. So capacitors have two different parameters they tell you. They will tell you the capacitance... The way I remember this, by the way, is by remembering QVC. Charge is equal to voltage times the capacitance. But this is the definition that C is defined as charge over voltage. So they'll tell you the capacitance and they will tell you the dielectric strength, the maximum. Well, actually, they don't tell you the dielectric strength. They tell you the maximum voltage. If you go above that voltage, you're going to exceed the dielectric strength and it's going to arc. And if you cause arcing in your cap capacitor, then you drill holes through your, your dielectric. And once you've drilled through holes through the dielectric, you have a dielectric strength of three for where those holes are. And so your capacitor becomes very flawed. Also, the capacitance will change when you have the arcing occurred because you drilled the holes. So in used capacitors, you have to pay attention to both numbers, the capacitance and the maximum voltage. One other thing before I move on, if we look at the pictures here, you see how this has a, a little ring here? That ring means this side needs to be connected to the positive. It has a dielectric that's not free to rotate. And because it's not free to rotate, you need to have this side here be the positive one because it's, that's the side that has the negative for the dielectric. So if it has a little ring around it or if it has something that says plus on this side, you need to make sure that's the positive side of what you're using. If it doesn't, then it doesn't matter which side's which because the dielectric can rotate. So with capacitors, we talked about it being an energy storage device. It would be kind of ridiculous to talk about capacitors and not talk about the energy they store. So if we're going to store energy, this picture can easily be understood by, well, I say easily. If I take two plates that originally are uncharged and I connect it to a battery, well, battery, Initially, they're uncharged, and I'm going to have one electron that goes across. 
if it's initially uncharged, the voltage difference across the capacitor was zero. But when that one electron goes across, now it has a little bit of charge. And because it has a little bit of charge, it has a little bit of electric field. And so after that first electron passes, you have a little bit of electric field, you have a little bit of a voltage here. And then if you pass more, it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so you have a line here that's a straight line of voltage is equal to Q times, or V, okay, Q equals VC. Perfect. That had to be yesterday too. Q equals VC, so V is equal to Q over C. Um, so the voltage is proportional to the charge. But the work necessary to move the charge is proportional to the voltage. And so it turns out that the work, notice here I have an integral equation. The work is the charge times dV, the voltage difference it goes through. Right, work is voltage difference times charge. And so if we're gonna add them up, we have the voltage difference is dV here. And if we do that calculation, it's the same as, and I know you don't have calculus in this class, but it's the same as taking the height of this line times the little width, just like when we did work was integral of force dot distance, so that the area under this line is equal to the total work that was done to move the charge across. And so for a triangle, area is equal to one half the base times the height. So that's one half the base is Q, the height is delta V, which is equal to Q over C. So those are two different ways of writing it. Now, there's a third way that I have here. Um, <clears throat> so any one of these are correct. Notice one half Q over C would be, or Q times Q over C is Q squared over C. So the energy stored, which is equal to the work that was done, is one half the charge on the capacitor squared divided by capacitance, which is also equal to one half the capacitance times the voltage difference across the square. So you can use either one of those, depending on your situation, to determine how much energy is stored. So if I tell you this capacitor has a capacitance of 10, ooh, we need units. We need units for capacitance. If we go back to the equation, <laughs> kappa is unitless. Area is meters squared, D is meters. So it's going to be the units of epsilon zero times meters or units of farads, which has abbreviation of F. That's short for Michael Faraday. So the unit for capacitance is farads. And, you know, if we look up epsilon zero, we get its units right. We'll have the complicated unit, but for our purposes, just capacitance and farads. Now the farad is large, so we're usually using microfarads or nanofarads or things like that. Um, <clears throat> first problem, the only problem we're gonna do because there's only two minutes left in class. A parallel plate capacitor has plates of area one meter squared. These are big plates. And a spacing of 0.5 millimeters, small spacing, between them. The insulator has a dielectric constant of 4.9 and dielectric strength of 18 kilovolts per millimeter. What's the capacitance? The equation for physical capacitance was kappa epsilon zero A over D. So that's going to be 4. Point, it was 4.9, right? Yeah, 4.9 times epsilon zero, 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12. I don't remember its units times the area, 1.00 meters squared, 
divided by the separation 5.00 times 10 to the minus 4 meters. So I multiply those through and I'm going to get the capacitance. And I see Trace pull out the cal calculator. Thank you, Trace. Um, I'm going to let him calculate while I go to the next one because we are running low on time. What's the maximum charge that can be stored in this capacitor? <clears throat> How do we determine the maximum charge? Okay. We have V max is going to be equal to the dielectric strength per millimeter multiplied by the separation. So that's 9.0 kilovolts. That's the maximum voltage we can have. And then for charge, Q is equal to VC. So v Q max is equal to V max C. So that's going to be 9.0 times 10 to the third volts. And what answer did you get there, Trace? Uh, 8.67 times by 10 to the negative And so 9 times 8.67 is going to be somewhere around 80. Now notice that capacitance was really small times 10 to the minus 8. We used the prefix nano then 10 to the minus 9. So the capacitance here was equal to 86.7 nanofarads. Okay, we're out of time. We'll leave it at that. Okay, I'm going to replace.